Hello and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei in Beijing. We begin today's program with the world's biggest free trade agreement measured in terms of GDP, the long-awaited Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, also known as RCEP, was signed by its 15 members on Sunday. The FTA is between the 10 ASEAN member states and five partners, namely China, Japan, South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. It covers nearly a third of the global population, about 30 percent of the global GDP. The agreement will reduce tariffs on trade in goods and improve rules for trade in services. Since its introduction at the 19th ASEAN Summit in November 2011, more than 30 rounds of talks have been held. And certainly, this is many consider RCEP as a vote for multilateralism and free trade. So what's the significance of RCEP overall and how is it going to compete with other FTAs in the region, some ask. Let's loop in our panelists, all from the region. And for more on RCEP, joining us in Beijing, Ji Jiangong, professor of uh, PBC School of Finance of Tsinghua University in Tokyo, Lin Tan Wai, a director research fellow from the National University of Singapore, and in Bangkok, Titi Nam Pong Sutirak, professor and director of the Institute of Security and International Studies from Chalolong Kong University, Faculty of Political Science. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. This is good news. However, before we celebrate it at 100 percent, we need to know that countries involved need to confirm, uh, and there is a process in every country. So how far are we from a real deal, uh, Professor Zhu? Well, the, all countries, the 15 uh, member countries need, need to sign. Uh, however, I guess you, we, we see a different uh, directions in Asia. Uh, while we know U.S. and even European, it's some some of uh, go back to the globalization, but in China, the opening up it's it's a speed up. So I'm I'm optimistic uh, for that will be signed soon. The major reason is because the largest economy in this region, China, actually speed up on the the opening up on the trade liberalization. As long as China want to push. I think that uh, opening up will be very quickly uh, established. Mm. Professor Titi Nampong Sotirak, uh, what is your take on this as a member of the ASEAN? How is Thailand articulating this? Well, I think it's a big uh, milestone for uh, regional trade liberalization in a uncertain, uncertain and anxious uh, multilateral trade environment. As we can see, you know, the, the multi multilateral trading system uh, has broken down. It has, it's not uh, been an international agreement uh, for some time. So short of that, uh, there's been second best outcomes like the CPTPP. I think it's very important for Thailand because Thailand has had uh, some domestic political difficulties. And as a result, Thailand has not been able to sign on to any FTA agreement for some time. So ASEAN is the first major FTA uh, agreement for Thailand, but also uh, very important for ASEAN. This is an ASEAN-centered um, agreement. It was uh, organized and arranged and, and peddled and all, you know, uh, by, by ASEAN countries this year being signed in Vietnam as the chair of ASEAN. So I think it provides some momentum and uh, some uh, focus for, for the ASEAN countries uh, that they are still central in this, uh, in this regional uh, liberalization. Uh, ASEAN centrality is still important. Uh, beyond that, I think for East Asia, you know, for China and Japan, this is the Northeast Asia uh, agreement as well with, uh, with together with Southeast Asia, together with Australia and, and New Zealand. Without India, I think that's something to be noted. Uh, India pulled out. Um, you know, this agreement could have been signed even last year. I mean, they were, they were finalizing it. I think the sticking point was, was India's participation. And I think some countries wanted to wait and, and uh, allow India to, to fully join, but India pulled out. So now it's just Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, the agreement, ASEP, uh, streamlines and consolidates a lot of the FTAs that the, the member countries, member economies already have with each other. Mm -hmm. So I think overall, 
um, it, it's something to be, um, I think, praised and um, congratulated, and also to realize that it's just uh, still a, a, a step in the right direction, uh, short of a multilateral trade liberalization agreement. Mm. Mr. Lim, your take. Uh, yes, of course, uh, Singapore is very excited about this uh, free trade agreement. Uh, it looks forward to working with its ASEAN colleagues, Northeast Asian colleagues, Oceanic colleagues, uh, for uh, making this uh, agreement possible. Uh, Singapore and uh, many other countries believe uh, that it will create jobs, but looking beyond that, uh, Singapore is already looking forward to a post-pandemic recovery. And this would definitely help with the post-pandemic recovery uh, because it breaks down barriers uh, for products uh, within uh, the, uh, the region. Uh, now, the uh, RCP is even more extensive than bilateral FTA agreements. Mm -hmm. For example, if you have a product that has a, a components from Indonesia and uh, from Australia, some of the uh, bilateral FTAs may not cover that. But when you have the RC in, RCEP in place, that means uh, within the region, all products with different components will be able to move uh, freely. Uh, also, in the far future, in the far future, uh, it is possible for uh, both uh, RCEP and CPTPP to admit future members. That's always a possibility. If the conditions are right, China may join CPTPP. If the conditions are right, US may join RCEP. And this will help uh, in the future forward to the final FTAAP, which is a much larger uh, free trade agreement. Professor Titor and Sun Tung uh, you know, one of the things people have been wondering about, of course, is the Indians' participation, but also what's going to be the role of the United States as that country is still going through its domestic uh, political storm as we speak about its election. So is this posing an opportunity for the United States, or is this, in a way, putting a competitive edge of uh, Asia and Oceanian countries together uh, against uh, or in competition against the United States? Well, this is going to put uh, pressure uh, for the United States because it has been um, left out, um, both uh, it has pulled out of the CPTPP That's right. and of course the U.S. Is part of uh, RCEP. Uh, at the same time, I think it will also pose a, a represent an opportunity for the U.S. to, to maybe rejoin the CPTPP. There will be a lot of incentive in Washington, I think that they will think that they have missed the boat. And, uh, you know, the U.S. is very polarized, as you can see. So now that one side, um, um, President Trump uh, uh, seems to be seems to have lost the election, and uh, even though it's contested, uh, it looks like President-elect Biden will be coming in, and his team uh, are full of uh, leftovers, holdovers from the Obama years. So I would not be surprised if they start to contemplate rejoining the CPTPP uh, because they're not in RCEP and they're pulled out of the CPTPP. On the other hand, RCEP now, you can see it's not just uh, Asia Pacific, but it's more East Asia. It doesn't include India now because India is pulled out. So this is a, a really different kind of vehicle uh, mm. for regional integration. East Asian economies, you can see there's some overlap. I mean, RCEP has uh, seven members who are in the uh, CPTPP, but RCEP also includes all the Southeast Asian countries, not just four in the CPTPP, so all ten. Uh, at the same time, I think that smaller economies uh, may not be as uh, prepared when it comes down to implementation. And I think ASEP is less ambitious than the CPTPP. It does not address a lot of the, of the provisions uh, on the services trade, for example. Right. So uh, opportunity and risk at the same time, but a lot of pressure for the U.S. now to join the, to rejoin the CPTPP. Professor, if I could just follow up a little bit about that. Uh, since the uh, U.S. is still uncertain about whether to join or not, and therefore many wonder, Professor, whether the future initiating stage of RCEP will be delayed. Meanwhile, many wonder, even after January inauguration of a president in the United States, the country will be uh, still as divided as it is today. So how much a president of that time will be able to push the trade agenda, even if he wants to? Uh, that's an all interesting question, but timing is very important, Professor. Well, the U.S., um, you know, they, as you mentioned, very divided and polarized. I mean, I think that um, they will have to uh, heal a lot of the problems at home. Uh, at the same time, I think the, the foreign policy security team of uh, President-elect Biden They'll be looking at the regions 
and they will be coming back with uh, some kind of their own strategy, maybe not the free and open Indo-Pacific as such uh, under Trump. I think the key question would be, um, you know, to what extent uh, will Biden uh, re-adopt some of the Obama policy posture and directions? And to what extent the Biden administration will reject everything that Trump has done? So um, I think maybe something in between, we, we may see the U.S. Uh, re-engaging in a different way, uh, less, uh, maybe the rhetoric will, will calm down a bit, maybe the substance will be more cooperative, um, and you know, I think that they will be looking at uh, somehow rejoining the, the, the regional trade order. At the same time, they'll also be concerned about China, uh, as the other countries will. You know, China is in RCEP, China is not in CPTPP. Uh, I think that um, we all want kind of a, a balance in the regional trade order. So if the U.S. Uh, gets back in, re-engages, maybe that will provide a better uh, international kind of regional atmosphere for liberalization and maybe, maybe also a better regional balance. Mm. Professor Zhu from China, what do you make of this uh, interesting question? Uh, how is China uh, articulating all these possibilities? This uh, RCB is uh, a very uh, welcome, uh, positive move. Uh, while it is, uh, uh, it is an additional step, China has already had the uh, free trade agreement with Asia, with uh, Korea, with Australia, with New Zealand. So I think RCEP it's it's uh, it's just a start point. Uh, there there will be a long way to go in China in in Asia to have an integrated market. A signing of RCEP it's a very positive signal. It shows that in Asian countries still are very much willing to uh, for the more open up, particularly in trade. We we can move like a service trade, like a digital economy, like the uh, uh, particularly in technology competitions, uh, uh, so there are, there are still many things that we, we, we should move up. Right. Professor Ji, you probably know the momentum in China better than I do. So, uh, but for people who are from outside China, they need to take a look at some of a series of events going on recently in China, probably to feel the temperature. Let me just mention some of them. For example, uh, the third import expo arguably the largest in the world that just took place in Shanghai. Meanwhile, China celebrated the 30th anniversary of Pudong New Area. That's 10 years after Shenzhen was established. But this is much more about financial sector combined with high tech. And then we have been hearing from the top Chinese officials, certainly about the 14th five-year plan, which emphasize about higher level of opening up, higher quality of opening up. Professor Zhu, uh, what seems to be what China wants to do right now? So as long as China want to move, uh, open up the market, mm -hmm. these other, other the, around the neighbor countries will enjoy larger benefits from this, uh, this market. As we, we see, China has uh, determined to opening a uh, domestic market to the neighbor countries. That will provide a public good. But Professor Titinan Pasutiraka, would you like to comment about the role of China and how do you think ASEAN is articulating it right now? Global public good? Regional public good? <laughs> well, there's a, certainly ASEAN uh, can and should be viewed as a regional public good. You know, um, freer trade is good for all the member economies, uh, especially as it uh, does not uh, erect or raise barriers to outsiders. So it's good for the region. I see another potential benefit here. You know, there have been a lot of geopolitical tensions in our region. Mm -hmm. And um, the idea that we have more you know, economic interdependence and um, trade enmeshment, freer trade, trade enmeshment among the, the regional economies could have a positive uh, spillover effect for, for other uh, areas. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is, uh, to me, I mean, ASEP is not a gold standard um, trade liberalization like the WTO plus plus or even the CPTPP. Nevertheless, it is significant. Uh, as the Professor Drew said, uh, you know, it allows the small economies a better chance to, to integrate within the region. Uh, at the same time, um, China will play, already has been playing a, a, a leading role as a locomotive for growth and development in the region. This will, will stamp and cement China's role in, the, in trade liberalization, in trade and, and economic growth. Um, 
at the same time, I think we also have to pay attention to the um, the tensions in the regions, and you know these are these are serious tensions. So RCEP could provide a, a platform, a bridge for 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 resolving some of these regional tensions because it creates a goodwill, a positive gestures in the in the trade realm, right. and that I think could spill into the the other geopolitical tensions we have. So you know it's something to build on. It's not automatic. Earlier, there were certain delays of the discussion due to various issues, the momentum and the political atmosphere. Now, finally get it done. How is Singapore looking at China at this point in this? Now, with the RCEP, that means that it is not just uh, uh, between uh, East Asian uh, entities like ASEAN and China, but it includes Oceania as well as uh, Northeast Asia. Mm -hmm. So this can only uh, uh, you know, mean uh, symbolically uh, very well and positively uh, signals uh, for free trade uh, in the region. Mm. Uh, of course, the role of China is very important. Uh, it is the largest player within the RCEP. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, this uh, uh, trade pact is also ASEAN-centric. So this uh, provides a very good complementarity between big economic players and also uh, the hub and spokes uh, kind of uh, model whereby the ASEAN is in the driver's seat uh, that makes it acceptable right. uh, for many players to come in. The most important thing is not competition or rivalry. The most important thing is to have a normative a free trade regulatory framework in which all players, big and small, uh, are able to play uh, fairly. Uh, and also this will lead uh, well into the future with the FTAAP, which is much larger, and there is some complementarity with the CPTPP as well. Because RCEP is the low-lying fruit, mm -hmm. therefore a lot of uh, its implementations can be easy. Uh, agriculture, for example, is not emphasized within RCEP. CPTPP is of high golden standards uh, with a focus on labor rights uh, as well as uh, environmental issues. With the right conditions, with the right conditions, perhaps even China may join CPTPP. So there's no zero-sum game here. If uh, the, uh, both uh, CPTPP as well as uh, RCEP progress well and are ratified, and should the incoming uh, Biden uh, uh, administration, which is, considered, which is widely considered to be multilateralist, re-engages uh, the uh, East Asia and Asia Pacific, I think this can only mean well for a world which is recovering Right. from the pandemic and it will create jobs for many countries it will also smoothen trade relations between many countries it is first and foremost a trade pact right. not a political pact but there can be some spillover some goodwill some uh, uh, confidence building measure that can spill over to the political realm uh, how much it will be able to withstand the vulnerability of politics especially geopolitics between China and the United States, uh, and also the politics within the United States, because there's unfortunately a tendency that uh, internal political struggles within U.S. is likely to be exported uh, onto issues of uh, international importance. So uh, that's many people, I'm sure, having in mind when we are celebrating, Mr. Lim. In the case of the U.S., uh, the expectation is not really focused on RCEP. The expectation is focused on CPTPP. Multilateralists within the U.S. are very pro, uh, uh, especially within the Biden administration. They are considering the possibility, possibility of rejoining the CPTPP. Now, this will be up to the U.S. to determine what are its own national interests and what are its economic interests. Now, for the RCEP, most of the uh, talk and concentration on future possible membership is actually on India. There are still a lot of members within the RCEP that are keen to bring India abroad when, as and when they are ready. So there is a special exceptional uh, rule that applies to India. Within the first 18 months when RCEP comes into play. No new members are allowed to join under the rules. 
with the exception that is made for India. So there are members within RCP that hopes India can join in uh, when, as and when they're ready or as and when it is, right. they consider it to be in their national interest. So That's this can also expand the scope of free trade beyond just East Asia, but it extends to South Asia as well. Mm. RCP is, is signed without the U.S. So that actually indicates uh, this, uh, the regional, regional corporations actually play a strong role. Uh, so that's the, that's the very, and um, while we see the WTO has a hard time and also the, uh, uh, what we call the super globalization has, has declined. However, this uh, different kind of what I call new globalization, which basically the regional uh, integrations actually uh, could move, uh, at least in Asia. So mm -hmm. that, I think it's very important signals. The contents of RCEP, yes, it is a small steps compared to CPTPP. CPTPP would cover much more higher, uh, more uh, materials. COVID-19, if you look at the world, Asia and the Asia plus Oceanian countries seems to be handling it apparently at this stage better than the rest of the world, let's just say, than Europe the North America, Latin America. So how much will that create a momentum for RCEP to move forward into real actions? Um, Professor Ju? I think at this atmosphere and uh, many uh, countries in, in these Asian countries could have more corporations in the uh, uh, COVID-19. And even in, in RCEP framework, and these Asian countries should talk how to uh, work together to uh, contain this COVID-19 and also to uh, rebuild the, the economic activities. Okay. At least, for example, looks like the code, right? This uh, uh, test code and this, uh, uh, fr this uh, flight, uh, normalized flight and between these uh, uh, member countries. And I, I think we, there are a lot of space we should talk together. Mm. Mr. Lin, now countries are closing the border, understandably, because of COVID-19. I understand where you're coming from, Singapore also doing it to a certain extent. When we talk about free trade, the free movement of both cargoes, ideas, money, and of course people. Uh, but at this moment, it is still difficult. So how much uh, will RCEP be able to provide a platform for all members, or not rather, parties to talk about it and to figure out a relatively good and flexible ideas and mechanism to have it done. I think that would be a very urgent task for RCEP, even though it is mainly about trade. Okay, uh, there are, first of all, the uh, global pandemic is a global event. So humanity must unite against uh, the uh, global pandemic. There are two stages to the global pandemic. First, you have to cope with the disease. And in this area, ASEAN plus three, including China, between East, East, Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia, they have cooperated uh, in trying to fight against and mitigate the effects of the pandemic itself. Then there is a second stage which is the economic impact of the pandemic. And it is in this economic impact of the pandemic that RCEP comes into very great importance because countries must look forward to a post-pandemic recovery. Right now, we have some vaccines available. Some of them are 90% effective. China also has come up with its own vaccines. So it is time to look beyond the pandemic to look after how we can cope with the post-pandemic economic recovery. RCEP in both symbolic terms. Symbolically, it means that free trade is back again, that you are creating an atmosphere as well as a framework in which you can have free trade to bring back uh, what was before the situation before the pandemic mm. and to recover as quickly from the pandemic economic effects as possible. 
Secondly, the free flow of trade also means that countries become more interdependent with each other. When countries become more interdependent with each other economically, it will result in greater understanding and confidence building measure. That's okay. where your people to people contact, which is the track tool of the exchanges can then come in. So trade will be the most important thing, but it will be a stimulus uh, for, other con uh, for other exchanges and contacts uh, to happen. And because uh, RCEP is now the world's largest free trade agreement, with 30% of the uh, world's population, 30% of the world's trade, and the largest in terms of GDP, this sends a very strong signal within an era where anti-globalization forces are emerging and where anti-globalization forces are being reinforced by conflicts that are brought about by the pandemic. Right. This will be a good signal that East Asia is back in business, that Asia Pacific can be back in business and that countries can recover faster. It is also symbolically a sign that East Asia is united to fight the economic impact stage of the pandemic, not just the pandemic itself, but the post-recovery stage. Certainly what you have just said, uh, Professor, we need to look much beyond the, just the next two to three years to look at the bigger picture. For now, I want to thank both of you for joining us. Uh, and of course, earlier with uh, Professor from Thailand, Ji uh, Jiandong from China, and Lin Tanwai from Singapore. Really appreciate it. Thank you.